listening to Overwatch League Daily, your daily source for Overwatch League news, scores, and more. Here's your host, Kicked Tripod. Hey, good morning, Overwatch League fans. This is your Overwatch League Daily episode for March 23rd, 2018. Today, I'm joined by Overwatch analyst Lemon Kiwi to discuss yesterday's matches. But first, we did have some news. The Dallas Fuel cannot catch a break. Their new tank OGE has been suspended by the league for four games for account boosting. With OGE and Taimu ineligible, it will be up to Mickey and Siegel to fill the tank role for the Fuel if yesterday's match was any indication. That's it for the news. Here's your scoreboard brought to you by patreon.com slash OWL daily show. For the first match of the evening, it was the Seoul Dynasty who are poised for a third place finish in stage two, taking on the Houston Outlaws who, after going 0-2 last week, are coming off a 4-0 victory against the Shanghai Dragons. The Dynasty ran a somewhat unorthodox lineup for this match with Kuki on main tank and Wakid Munchkin holding down the DPS role on each map but Watchpoint Gibraltar. In a surprising result, the Houston Outlaws would upset the Dynasty three maps to one. With their loss, just four maps separate the third and fifth place team, and it's highly unlikely that Seoul make the playoffs in stage two. For the second match of the evening, the Dallas Fuel played a surprisingly scrappy match against the first place NYXL, taking it to five maps. In the end, NYXL would hold on and will continue to coast into the Stage 2 playoffs at eight wins and one loss. For the final match of the evening, we'd get to see the San Francisco Shocks' second attempt at a W with Sinatra eligible. This match would echo their earlier series against the Florida Mayhem going to all five maps. In the end, the Shock couldn't pull this one out dropping the series to the Boston Uprising, three maps to two. Here is my conversation with Lemon about yesterday's games. So let's start by talking about the Dynasty versus the Outlaws. Obviously, the end result was surprising, but uh, something that was interesting is that the Dynasty didn't play their typical best of six, or I guess their starting six. We only saw Fleta on one match, and I don't know if we saw Miro at all. I'm trying to think off the top of my head. Um, but uh, Yeah, I don't e- think so. Yeah, so either way, we, we didn't see the the normal uh, six from the Dynasty. Uh, how big of a factor, in your opinion, was that into the final score? I think that's been a, a big criticism towards the Seoul Dynasty, um, if there were to be any criticism, because they just have outstanding players, is kind of messing up their core, messing with their core a lot. So in the series versus Outlaws, uh, we've seen a lot more Kuki and Wekid, um, if I'm pronouncing that right, than we usually do. Um, those two have never, for example, played Hanamura for Soul in Stage 2. So it's generally usually Fleta and Munchkin, or Miro and Zumba um, that are doing the tanks. So Wekid hasn't Um, played really much soldier since LW Red. And it's a question mark on how much they've practiced integrating these players, or at least on maps like that. Um, So while Houston are running their core lineup during this entire time, um, Houston win Hanamura after a crazy seven-minute hold on defense. And this was, I would say, mostly due to them being very good at stalling out each fight before they even start. So whether it's rip tires, pulse bombs, uh, primal rages, they just stop soul in their tracks. So they never really get a soul, never really get a good footing in the fight. So, um, so I think it was more due to Houston just playing so well on Hanamura. Um, and especially where Houston get to play their comfort picks, like Jake ending up playing Junkrat and links are on the tracer. Um, And then you go on to Nepal, where this was Houston's weaker map, I would say, or weaker even game mode, since they only have a 44% win rate on control, while Seoul have a closer to a 70% win rate on maps uh, of control and being 4-1 and on Nepal. So this was already um, Houston, uh, sorry, Seoul's map to win. And again, Kuki and Wekid have not played Nepal for Seoul um, at all. So how much... Do they know or how much have they practiced being integrated on maps like that? 
Um, I think Zumba especially impressed me playing the Roadhog on map on the map of Sanctum, which hasn't been really seen in this hero pool from stats that I've seen uh, um, on his previous teams. So Stole start getting their footing um, by winning that control map. So then going on to King's Row, which, which is one of Stole's weaker maps. They're one in three, I think, before that map. Um, and even lost that uh, King's Row to Dragon. So it kind of proves that they don't... I'm not sure what the, what they're like on King's Row. And again, it's usually Miro and Fleta that play King's Row. So then you see Kuki and Wekid here. Um, Kuki... Cookie, <laughs> I can't even pronounce his name, has only seen King's Row against the Dragons where they lost. So, I don't know. That kind of gives you an idea. So, Soul bring out the triple tank where Zumba, I think, was such a hard carry for me as Zarya. And you see Zumba and Wekid really start to build a synergy together towards the end of King's Row. But because they burned so much time, they finished the map in overtime. Um, Houston only had to win by winning, getting the first tick after the second rotation with two minutes to win. So I think you saw a little bit more strides of Soul Dynasty with this um, a non-core lineup, to say the least. Um, and Houston, I think it's more of a question of Houston playing so cohesively with their core lineup. And on King's Row, where a map is just so suited for Jake Rat or Junk Rat, and he was able to shine on that one. And you see, they bring out finally Fled on Gibraltar. But the poor guy was just getting sniped left, right, and center from Linkser. He just could not get anything going. I think at one point in the match, they said like five out of eight um, deaths from Fleta was due to Linkser on the Widow. So you saw Fleta trying to adapt to this, swapping to the Widow himself, losing all those Widow duels, going back to the Genji. And Fleta just, ha- I wouldn't say had a bad map, but just couldn't deal with Linkser. And Linkser was just such a hard carry for Houston. And they end up winning that map and the series three to one. So all in all, to answer your question, yes, the fact that Kuki and Weki not being in the regular lineup, I think maybe hindered their ability to compete or complete offenses as quick as they could have. But the real answer is, is that not that Soul played bad, but Houston's core lineup just really popped off in that series. Something that, uh, and I'm putting you on the spot here. Don't worry. Uh, you're, I, I, you don't have a crystal ball. You don't have some insider knowledge here. I just want to hear your, uh, just your feeling on the, uh, like on the fact of why in such an important match for Soul, right? Soul essentially has playoffs locked in as long as they. Uh, they win their games this week, and it didn't really look like uh, the these were souls games to lose. Basically, is is how I w- I would put it. Uh, why? <laughs> like, why would you change that up? Uh, we've seen them do uh, the same thing. I can't remember. I think it was against London. Uh, Might have been London. And uh, just just why why do you think that they would make such drastic changes to their lineup? for such an important match? It's hard to say. I'm not a coach. Uh, I, I, I don't know what really the background answer would be if I were to assume. Why would you take away from your core? Or why would you switch out of your core lineup, um, which would more likely get to you the guaranteed win is... They, they I, maybe they don't want to rely too much on... They just maybe don't want to rely too much on Fleta. Maybe, I don't know if the pressure is getting to him. Maybe playing kind of like hockey, where if you swap out your players pretty often, then they'll play at their maximum capacity for every map. That would be my thing, maybe, (laughs) taking a hockey reference, but having not having Fleta your best player in matches like these is a surprising um, choice, which a lot of fans, I think, have questioned from the side of Soul Dynasty. And kind of the same thing in Stage 1. I think near the end of a stage, Souls start to crumble under pressure, and they're trying to maybe have an upper hand in the meta by swapping out all these different players to catch these teams off guard but maybe they need to stick to the core and work on improving their play instead of trying to change a strategy and trying to figure out what works i mean at at the end of the day if you make playoffs right and and you win one match you're either winning twenty five thousand dollars or a hundred thousand dollars uh that that's a big deal and at least half of that has to go to the players Right, so you're looking at a minimum fifty thousand divided by whatever. You're looking like like a five to eight thousand dollar bonus. So that's just really, uh, it's just weird to me. I hope that we get a more concrete answer. Maybe there is already one out there that we haven't seen yet tonight. 
Uh, but let's let's talk about Jake in Junkrat. We uh, it, and you've kind of alluded to it. We haven't seen Houston look this good playing Overwatch basically <laughs> all of stage two. And this was the first time where since the nerfs, I, I feel like we really saw them plan around playing Jake on the Junkrat rather than trying to force Tracer into uh, play here. Do you think that Jake on Junkrat is the best chance for the Houston Outlaws to win until they get uh, for what I call a quote unquote carry tracer? <laughs> I think, yeah, a lot of their win potential or just how well they did in stage one was a lot due to Jake getting used to the Junkrat and then the Mercy meta. They played so well there and then you got stage two, you got a different meta. I think they were trying to adapt to different things, but Jake's Junkrat, um, he's admitted, or I'll say Jake's Tracer, let's talk about that. He's admitted into his interview that he's he knows he's one of the weaker Tracers in the league, but his job is not to, I'd say not to get kills or not to get damage, but his in his mind, his main role is to enable Linkser and distract the other team away from him. And we just saw in Gibraltar how um, well Linkser does when he is enabled. And... You know, Jake also wants to enable Muma on the objective. So he's a team player. And I think that's why Jake's Tracer is actually very good. And you can ignore the stats around him because it's how he enables his team to win. Um, I'm a little bit maybe a question mark about what is their plan for Clockwork going to be? Because that was initially their main Tracer um, for these stages. You know, that's right. most, I think 70% of his play is on Tracer. And He's now only subbed in on map ones on Assault. And for example, he's only seen full match play since I think the first two matches of stage two. And out of his last eight map appearances, he's only won three maps. So yeah, you're exactly right. They don't have that carry tracer yet. But when it comes to Linkser on Tracer, he mostly plays it when Jake is playing Soldier or Junkrat, which Jake carries on those roles. So when Linkser gets the freedom um, to be Tracer... And when you have an insane DPS as Jake by your side, I think Linkser can be a very capable tracer. Um, and I think Jake's, you know, Junkrat will be the key to success to enable Linkser. And maybe we can see um, the Houston Outlaws pick up a carry tracer, for example, from contenders. But with 11 players on their roster, they might have to uh, make some room. Yeah, it'll it'll be really interesting. I, this was a really interesting match and a really surprising one. And I think one that, uh, if if you're reviewing VODs, this is one I would go back and look at because uh, this whole match was just, there's so many interesting things going on. But I really want to talk about the shock versus the uprising because there's a lot of uh, big storylines here. But let's let's talk about just the match first. The shock have really, well, really did struggle in the first half of this series. But they uh, turned it around almost all the way in the second half. What did they change after halftime to keep up with the uprising? There was a lot of roster uh, or lineup swaps for the shock throughout the series. Um, and just onto map one, you're very happy to see uh, Sinatra on the board. But just Striker put up such a stiff competition to Sinatra on the tracer, like in the first map. Um, Striker outperformed Sinatra. I think it was 27 final blows to 14, 44 limbs to 35 with similar deaths. So Striker just really outperformed Sinatra. Um, uh, and I agree that Shock really struggled on their offense to Hanamaru, Hanamaru, but they still ended up clinching that map, <laughs> which we all were kind of surprised watching it uh, back home. And in the same situation on Nepal, where what Boston win two to nothing, Striker goes 22 and one on Shrine. Uh, Dream Casper on Widow also started to take strides with like a ridiculous like 86% win, uh, sorry, a uh, crit rate. And then you saw Sinatra really try to carry, he got these multi kills that actually allowed the Shock to retake the point. Um, like initially on Shrine, I think it was a triple kill from him. And he had a really good performance on Junkrat. And at halftime, so to address your question, I guess we're at third map. 
Shock try it, the combin they take out Sinatra and they put Baby Bay and Dante in. But Dream Casper's widow was just unstoppable and Baby Bay couldn't touch him playing the widow himself. And Shock's offense is just stuffed. And then on defense, Dante and Baby Bay try the Junkrat Soldier, but again, they just get rolled by Dream Casper on Masfara. So it's been sort of the recurring point of Dream Casper playing so well for Boston. Um whatever shock was trying out just wasn't working so perhaps swapping out sinatra was just not the answer for that map so they bring sinatra back on route 66 and you know same duo from map one dante and sinatra and you see they they start to work better together and this was a much better performance out of dante on genji um wasn't too impressive on hanamura so shock are able to force the map five so starting to see that sinatra could be the answer so they keep him in for map five and um but it would have been nice to see baby bay especially on um i think it was elios because he just has a more reliable soldier in Farah, which is a very far or soldier heavy map to go against dream casper so sold uh, sinatra had to pick up the soldier role and he just could didn't have enough freedom to deal with dream casper so unfortunately shock dropped the map five um and, you know you saw sinatra even try other things like he tried the widow but was getting couldn't deal with the dream on ruins and i still believe that sinatra and baby bay are the better duo um mm -hmm. in, in, uh, instead of sinatra and dante let's uh let's go on the other side and let's talk about the uprising and specifically dream casper because uh, as you've kind of said dream casper kind of popped off in this one this was uh in my opinion his best performance in stage two this far we saw him flex to multiple heroes uh in comms we saw great leadership from him there he uh essentially route 66 was you know all about or not route 66 hollywood was all about uh the shock trying to figure out how to uh get to dream casper on widowmaker uh and so he consistently won the widowmaker duel what didn't the shock do to dr address Dream Casper? They tried, but it just wasn't good enough. Sinatra's widow on Ruins wasn't good enough. Baby Bay's widow on Hollywood wasn't good enough. They didn't run Baby Bay on Elios, um, like as a soldier to Faro duel, um, or even a soldier against Dream Casper's Farah. Um, which, you know, Sinatra is a capable soldier, but I mean, like, Baby Bay would have been the better answer to just Faro duel in the sky. Um, they were better able to address um, Dream Casper when he played, let's say, McCree on Route 66 or Genji on Hanamura, where he's more accessible, I, I want to say. But Shock are going to have to st step up their Widow play or commit more members to deal with Dream Casper in these 1v1s, which have rarely ever gone in Shock's favor. Because, like you said, Dream Casper plays so well during that series. But when you have a Tracer like Striker running around, it's just so difficult for the Shock to prioritize if they want to deal with Striker or do they deal with Dream Casper, which fortunately they're both dangerous people for Boston. So I think um, it's just hard to prioritize who they want to deal with. They've tried, but they're going to have to step up their performance to deal with Dream. Well, and I think, uh, I think Dream Casper and uh, Striker are one of the most... Uh, especially, uh, they're just one of the most terrifying duos in Overwatch League right now. Uh, you can't, you have to babysit both of them. If you don't, <laughs> yeah. one enables the other. They're so good at doing that right now. And I know uh, people joke about Huck the Oracle. He definitely <laughs> got a couple <laughs> of winners with these guys. But we should um, really talk about the elephant in the room here. And that's Sinatra. Sinatra now has completed his first week in Overwatch League. They went 0-2 in Overwatch League against two teams in the bottom four. Both went to five maps. I, I think uh, four wins, six losses total, uh, if, if I'm counting right on, on the maps. But based on that alone, how did he perform? Is he performing to uh, expectations? I think absolutely he is. He needs a team. What he needs is a team that can enable him and finish off the kills with him or play more with him. Uh, like, for example, you saw in Hanamura's that I had, I highlighted earlier where Stryker had like double the, or Sinatra had half the finishing blows that Stryker had with similar damage. Um, and you also saw Sinatra really carry on maps like Sanctum and Nepal, you know, getting multi kills and single handedly allowing Shock to retake the point. 
And you see Sinatra on the kill feed all the time to trying to equalize those numbers for the team. But to me, he plays more of a lone wolf style of tracer, which either rewards or punishes his team for maybe not playing as cohesively. But overall, um, the shock need to develop around Sinatra and see how they're going to integrate them with their overall play style. And that's something I, I'm going to put a big giant asterisk after that answer. <laughs> we know it's been just one week. We're not trying to say, oh, yeah, Sinatra's awful or, oh, he's amazing. But it's important to take that first look at his performance and uh, see, you know, where we think it might go from there and what needs to change. Which leads me to my last question before we get out of here. And this one, we've got to be we've got to be careful. Right. Uh, it, because. Like I said, it's only been two matches. They've got Moth on support, so they're integrating new players. Uh, they're trying to play dive when they have really, like, if I'm being completely blunt, have really sucked at dive <laughs> in the past. Uh, should Shock fans be worried about uh, this this new Shock look that we're seeing right now? Well, I think the Shock have such a wonderful fan base that love them so much. So I think they could lose every match and the fan base will still love them and not worry a bit. But it, to be realistic, there's no point of worrying. There's a lot of teams in Stage 2 making changes to their roster. Um, and I think the real Shock, no point intended, will come in Stage 3. They've already, I don't think they've made the, I think they're out of the playoffs officially. So they can relax and develop on and focus on developing their strategies and integrating Sinatra better into the lineup and figuring out what duos work and having their tanks play more with Sinatra. Um, they've acquired one of the best tracers in the world, so you got to expect big things for the Shock in the future. Well, Lemon, I really appreciate you taking the time to hang out with me at 2.45 a.m. <laughs> if people are wondering, <laughs> how do we get a show out from one day to the next. It's staying up until two to three in the morning. Uh, but thank you so much for joining me again. Uh, thank you for I, having me. I always love getting to, to hear your insight on Overwatch League. Uh, thanks for having me. It's been great staying up till 3 a.m. Talk some Overwatch with you. <laughs> Bye. My thanks to Lemon for stopping by on the show. Make sure to follow her on Twitter at LemonKiwi underscore. Tomorrow, we don't have a show. Originally, we weren't going to have a show on Wednesday and go Thursday through Monday so that we could recap the stage finals. But with Uber and Bren coming on, what we decided to do was just to kind of have a little gap in the middle. So there will be no show for tomorrow. If you like the show, make sure to subscribe on YouTube, iTunes, or your podcast app of choice to not miss future episodes. You can also watch or listen to the show on the front page of winstonslab.com. You can also find links to everything at overwatchleagedaily.com. And if you have a question or comment for the show, email me overwatchleagedaily at gmail.com. My thanks again to Lemon Kiwi for joining me. I'll be back on Saturday with another episode of Overwatch League Daily. <laughs>